Is Fred Princeton Hydro? Yep, I'm see. here. Now there he is. I knew I saw him, saw him before somewhere. Go ahead. All right. Um, so yeah, I, I have a, a bunch of stuff to go through. I did uh, forward to Colleen a uh, PowerPoint presentation. Let me bring it up now. Yeah, if you could, please. Okay, I'll, 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 you. I'll start with that first. I'll share my screen and then you can just tell me when to um, switch the slide. Okay, thank you. All right, so I just wanted to give a real quick update um, based on the data that we collected uh, uh, during our May sampling event, as well as an update on the HAB grant. In addition, I, I wanna let you know that we will be sampling this Thursday, depending on the weather, but we're shooting for this Thursday, and I'm actually going to be out with the crew. Um, we have a lot to get to, not only for the standard monitoring, but we're doing some pre-monitoring, and I'll get into that in, in just a moment. So next slide, please. Um, so just to go over some of the grant activities. So uh, we're working with a number of projects at Ashley Cove. We conducted our first water quality monitoring event, and I have to correct something. Uh, I, I identified that we retrieved a rogue floating wetland island. Uh, that did not happen. I did, I, we were supposed to do that. I did hear from the sampling crew. They did not get to that. So we'll have to reschedule that for another day. And, and Donna was uh, actually identified. She said, hey, the island's still out there. And then just before this meeting, I heard from Katie, one of our uh, field techs, that it was not retrieved. So we, we still have to do that. Um, we are planning next week to do a Foslock treatment in Ashley Cove. Foslock is that clay-based product that inactivates phosphorus in the water column and the sediment. Uh, speaking of that, the next uh, um, project I have identified is the large Foslock treatment for the landing area. Uh, the material will be delivered on the 12th of June, uh, and we are initiating the treatment on the 15th. Uh, so that's about a 50 um, acre treatment, obviously dependent on weather. Uh, but again, we're looking to strip the water column of available phosphorus as well as bind some of the phosphorus in the sediments. Um, this week when we're out sampling, we will do the pre-sampling in the landing area. Uh, for the three aeration systems, we're working on the municipality with the municipalities and the beach clubs to get those installed, hopefully sometime within the next, I'd say, one to two months. Um, we're working with uh, Cat Beach Club. Um, so we did hear from them. They're very interested in the green clean treatment we're going to do off of their beach. Green clean is an alternative to copper sulfate. It's a strong oxidizer. Uh, not only does it kill algae uh, without copper, but it's also supposed to be able to break down cyanotoxins and taste and odor compounds. So we're going to do that treatment sometime over the summer and then evaluate to see if, uh, first of all, if there are halves in the water, um, we'll test for that. And secondly, if there are, does this product help to break those halves down? So they were very interested in that. I believe they had a meeting last night. Uh, so I provided them with some information on the treatment and um, any restrictions associated with the treatment. Uh, next slide, please. Try a question before you go. Mm -hmm. What's yes. the purpose of retrieving the, uh, wet, the uh, wetland islands in Ashley Cove? Well, so, so some of them broke away and they're out in the main body of the lake over at Liffey Island. So oh. we, have to, we have to bring that island back to Ashley Cove, re-anchor it and replant it. We're also going to install a new island as well. One of the problems with the floating wetland islands at Ashley Cove, and we, we figured this out, We've been doing floating wetland islands for about a decade now. And the one thing we've seen is if you really want them to be successful, they have to have full sunlight. So instead of having them along the side of the shoreline where they're in the shade, um, we've coordinated and worked with um, Michael Calvario and the harvesting team. So we're actually gonna install the islands in the middle of the cove uh, and, and work with Michael so that he can still get the machines in there um, but to make sure that they get the full sunlight. So we have to retrieve that island and re-anchor it. Got it. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so for the biochar installation, so this week on the 11th of June, uh, we will have one or probably more than likely two 
Princeton Hydro reps who will be showing the municipalities the biochar and how to construct the sausages of biochar. Biochar is essentially um, processed wood material that has a high affinity to remove pollutants, in particular phosphorus from the water column. Uh, so we're going to show the municipalities how they can use this material. Um, we've also went through and, and identified that um, installing the material is permit by rule. So I'm waiting to get a memo and a uh, map from our regulators internally. And it sounds like that was moving forward. They got the map completed. So we'll have that information available for the 11th of June. But the whole goal of that training event is to show the municipalities how they can actually purchase this material and build these, these what, what, the, what, are, what are called sausages. So as part of the grant, we Princeton Hydro will be installing these in key locations throughout the watershed with in-kind support from the municipalities. But the long-term goal is to get the municipalities to start using this material. <laughs> um, number one, it's pretty cost effective. It's not expensive material. Number two, when you're done with it, you can use it as mulch. So it, it's a nice green reuse. So um, we'll be running this project for the next two years. Uh, and um, so that training event will occur on the 11th of June. And I'm hoping to get some, some, some of our people to start building the sausages for our projects on Wednesday. Um, we need about 70 of these uh, structures um, for all the projects we want to do around Lake Opaca. Um, and uh, also related with the biochar, we're, we're looking at those large aquafilter structures in the borough of Apacon. We're looking at removing the material that's accumulated in them and uh, replacing them with biochar to see if we can use that material in those structures as a way of, of enhancing their phosphorus removal as well. Um, there's also the Rutgers Rain Garden Program. We don't have anything we're, we're, Princeton Hydro is not involved in that, but Colleen, I didn't know if you had anything to report on that, so I, I put it on the uh, list. Yeah, sure. We had um, last week on June 4th, we held two sessions, one in the morning and one in the evening. Um, we had 100 registrants and 60 participants, and the goal is to install 16 rain gardens throughout the watershed. Um, we have two more sessions to hold, and we're we're thinking we're going to hold off until the fall or the spring um, and see if we can hold those ones in, in person. Excellent. Do you, do you know how many people uh, followed up to try to apply for those grants? I did get um, an email from Rutgers today, uh, but I haven't, I haven't had time to look it over. Yeah, I, I attended uh, one of the seminars and it was excellent. Very, very well done. I learned a lot. I attended as well, and I think it's something the Land Use Committee can look into or something we should look into for recommendations on these site plans around the lake. Yeah, and I'll, I'll tell you, from my experience, too, of, of monitoring rain gardens and biofiltration systems, you can get, even though you're dealing with small pieces of property, um, they, are, they have high removal rates for phosphorus. So it's something that collectively if a number of people implement rain gardens, they can really have a positive impact, you know, on the watershed and the lake in general. It's the kind of thing like that boathouse application or other applications that are pending mm -hmm. can do, I think, easily put in small applications. Yep. Either shoreline, there's a shoreline example in that Rutgers thing, as well as the rain garden. Yep. Absolutely. I think people have to be convinced about how attractive they can be and how well they can flourish. And the, the problem is people love a beautiful grass lawn and, and uh, it, it's kind of a matter of taste and, and learning really how, how nice these can look when they're properly done and how yep. well they can function. Yep, and absolutely. We had actually hoped that had already built three of them by now, um, but with COVID and, and not being able to have volunteers, we haven't been able to do that. Mm -hmm. Yep. At the park, that is? Yeah, yeah. Oh, great. A great example. Yeah, we're going to do some uh, educational stuff there as well, some signage to let people know what they are. And, oh, and perfect. Are. That would be perfect. Good. All right. Um, and so just some other activities. Um, so our next water quality monitoring event will be on the 11th. Um, I, I will be out on the lake because there's a lot of 
pre-treatment that we need to do, uh, pre-treatment monitoring, so I, I wanna be out there. And then we also have our two cyanotoxin algal monitoring events. The first one will occur in July. We, we try to do that one you know, a, you know, immediately after the 4th of July. Um, so it's gonna be somewhere on the, that um, first full week, you know, somewhere around the, you know, the week of the 6th of July where we do the cyanotoxin and algal monitoring event. Uh, so that's what's going on uh, in terms of the, uh, some, some of the field related activities and some of the HAB stuff. Um, next slide, please. Um, I did want to show some data. Um, so this is showing you data from May of 2019 and 2020. I can say that the good news with the phosphorus concentrations is overall in the lake, uh, the total phosphorus concentrations are lower this year for May compared to May of last year. So the average last year was 0 0.034, which was above our threshold, and that's what that red line represents and each bar is one of our sampling stations. So, so we like to keep the concentrations at or below 0 0.03. And you can see last year, most of them were above 0 0.03. Uh, this year, most of them were below 0 0.03. So the average for this year was 0 0.024. Um, so we had lower phosphorus concentrations in the lake, that would, which you know, is good, that's what we wanna see. Next slide, please. Um, I, I'm showing this because I want to equate chlorophyll A to cell counts since we don't do cell counts at every sampling station, um, but I wanted to use chlorophyll A as a surrogate to that. So if you look at, this is from the World Health Organization, and if you look at cyanobacteria cell counts, there's that 20,000 threshold that DEP used to use just for the advisory. And you can see if you're at less than 20,000, typically your chlorophyll A concentration, which is a photosynthetic pigment that all algae uses, is below 10. Uh, so just keep that in mind. And I do want to note that, you know, based on, our, uh, on the TMDL for Lake Apacon, if all the projects have been implemented in, and in full compliance, the average chlorophyll A concentration we predict would be around eight. So we would be just below that, that 10 threshold, which means cyanobacteria cell counts should in general be below 20,000. That's where we want to get to when we implement all the, project, all the projects identified in the watershed implementation plan. Next slide, please. So this is showing you the chlorophyll A concentrations um, for last year and for this year uh, at Lake Capacon. And um, you can see that even though most of them were above 10 last year, they were, they, we didn't have the high concentrations that we've seen this year. So if you look at the orange bar, that orange bar is the mid-lake station. And we had unusually high amount of chlorophyll A in the center of the lake. And so the, the, um, the orange, the green, and that brown bar, those really high ones are open water areas. And look how low the others are. Um, so for example, the gray bar. The gray bar is River Styx Crescent Cove. Normally that's one of the highest in terms of chlorophyll A. And you can see in May last year, the gray bar for River Styx Crescent Cove was one of the highest values. This year, it was one of the lowest. And that's good for water quality. But the problem was, is it was so clear it allowed all the plants to grow. So, you know, it's like, uh, I, I think Marty mentioned, we're sort of battling two battles. It's the, the issues with the haves, but when you have very clear water in shallow areas, you have issues with weeds. So you can see that we had, in the open waters, we had some of the high chlorophyll A concentrations, but we had clearer water overall um, in the shallow areas. Um, so, and, um, the concentration of um, cells at that uh, station two, which is mid lake, that orange bar, that real high one, that was that was at about twenty eight thousand cells per mil. So it, it was above the um, original threshold that DEP had, but now um, it's called a watch. So it's not even an alert yet. And again, that's mid lake. So I do want to emphasize that even though we saw more algae in the open waters, 
they were extremely high, number one. And number two, we're attributing this to the very mild winter we had. Um, with such a mild winter, a lot, of this, a lot of the blooms continued through the course of the um, winter season. I know DEPs identified some lakes where they had cyanobacteria just go right through the winter season. Um, so that, you know, so we, had, we have higher amounts of algae, but fortunately lower amounts of phosphorus to fuel their growth. Uh, next slide, please. This is the last slide, and um, I'm just bringing this to everyone's attention. So this is Secchi depth in the center of the lake in May for the last 10 years. And you can see that there has been this declining trend in the clarity in May, and that I'm kind of concerned about. However, when I did look at the Secchi depths for this year and last year, um, even though the mid lake had a low Secchi depth, we actually overall throughout the lake, clarity was slightly better this year compared to last year. So the average Secchi depth this year was um, point, was, I'm sorry, 1.6 meters. Last year, the average was 1.3 meters. So again, slightly better clarity throughout the lake. And again, that's one of the reasons why we see a lot more weeds is we had a mild winter and clear conditions in the shallow areas that allowed the weeds to grow. Um, so this is something we're definitely gonna keep an eye on. And like I said, later this week, we're gonna be out on the lake uh, collecting all of this data again. We're gonna be out on the lake about a year. It's, I think it's only a day off compared to when we sampled Lake Apacon last year. And remember the blooms really hit gangbusters around the 15th of, May, of June. So um, I really wanna get out there and see what's going on in terms of the lake and the phosphorus concentrations. Um, so that's what I have for that. I do have some other information, but I didn't know if anyone had any questions before you. Before, before you get off this, two mm -hmm. points, things you, you frequently talk about. We definitely had a cooler spring and we've had significantly less rain. We're, we're down rain by 50%. And also we had very windy, rough, rough water, which you've described as, as interfering with hab growth. Those, I think those three things have been pretty significant this year. So it looks like more weeds and less habs. And of course, there hasn't been any cutting yet. So places like Crescent Cove are already overgrown. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, what, do you agree that? Yeah, I, I do agree with that. Um, and definitely what, what gives me of those three components, you know, the temperature, the, the windy conditions, you know, the lack of rain and, and the phosphorus, the one that, that's probably really helping the best is not having a lot of phosphorus in the lake right now. Um, I, uh, that's the big one because the problem is, is things can warm up very quickly and things can just all of a sudden just settle down. So literally within a matter of a week or two, you could have conditions that really fuel a blue-green algae bloom. But if you don't have the phosphorus, it makes it difficult for those blooms to really take off. So um, I, I, the, the first good news that I showed were those phosphorus concentrations. I'm hoping that's going to continue. I'm hoping that the data we get this week of phosphorus shows that those concentrations are still at or below that 0 0.03. I think if we're still there, we should be in a, in a much better position this year compared to last year. Is that lack of rain with less runoff? That's part of it. That's part of it. I mean, there are other components that have to do with it. You know, there's, there's all the activities that are going on in the watershed as well. I mean, that's one of the reasons why we have the watershed implementation plan. We wanna make sure that we're implementing those stormwater measures. So when we do get rain, a lot of that phosphorus is being removed. Um, so that absolutely helps. Remember, I described that pattern last June, we got into that pattern where we would get a lot of rain and then a couple sunny days of weather, a lot of rain and a couple sunny days of weather. And uh, that, that really helped to develop those blooms. And we saw that because it was a green ring all the way around the lake. It wasn't just one spot. So I think the fact that we're having some nice sunny days, not a lot of rain, I, there's a chance of, of, of some stormy weather on um, 
on, on actually the day we want to sample on Thursday, but we're not in that pattern that we were last year. So, you know, definitely keeping our fingers crossed that phosphorus will stay below that threshold. All right. 